All right. I think we're, I think we're live. Um, good afternoon. My name is Brian Boswell. I'm the Vice President of Research and Development at SavingForCollege.com. I want to thank all of you very much for joining us today for our first Facebook Live event. Um, we're still working out some of the kinks, so please bear with us. Um, I want to make sure everybody can hear me okay. So if you are listening and can type a comment in the comment box, just let us know where you're from, um, maybe why you want to join us, put something out there so that I can know that you can hear me okay. I'd really appreciate it. Um, also, as I'm going through kind of uh, uh, the presentation, I want you to know that you can ask questions at any time. Oh, he's not seeing video. Uh, let me know if you can see the video as well. I'm hearing some people may not be able to see the video. Um, <clears throat> so ask questions anytime. If you have any questions, let me know. Just put a comment in the comment box. Uh, Judy's going to help me out with that. Uh, and if I don't answer or if I don't get to your questions, please um, ask a question in our forum. We have forums available at forum.savingforcollege.com. Um, also, at the end of the uh, at the end of the video, I'm going to be announcing the gift card winner. So whoever it is that uh, that won our Amazon gift card incentive. So thank you very much again for joining us. Um, just a little bit about who I am. My name is Brian Boswell. Again, I'm the Vice President of Research and Development at SavingForCollege.com. I've been working in the 5 to 9 savings industry since 2001. Um, I've, been, I've had many roles now at this point. I've worked as an analyst. I've worked as an industry expert. I've worked in advisor sales at a census college savings, which is the largest, um, the largest administrator of 5 to 9 assets in the country. Um, and I'm also a, a little bit about me personally. I'm a graduate of Rensselaer. I went to Rensselaer for four years. Uh, that's where I, actually where I met my wife and got married in 2003. Uh, I'm a father. I have three kids of my own, so I very much understand the need to, to save for college. I have triplets, three eight-year-old kids. Um, they uh, Their expected cost, if you go out and use some of the savings calculators, is about $1.1 million. So every single day I'm reminded when I look at them of how much I'm going to have to, to spend for my own kids' college education. Um, and Judy, Judy Minsk is from Putnam Investments, is joining me today. She's graciously joined me from, uh, from the city of Boston. No, for... I'm excited. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for <laughs> it's, inviting it's me. Fun. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Judy Minsk, and I'm a senior manager um, for investment strategies at Putnam Investments. I've been at Putnam for 23 years, actually, just uh, about a month or so ago. And, you know, we've been committed to college savings at Putnam um, for certainly for decades, but since 2000 have been working on 529 plans, which we'll talk a bit about today, I would expect. And we're fortunate enough to partner up with the state of Nevada on our 529 plan, Putnam 529 for America. We are excited, um, again, you know, even looking towards the future, we talk about how quickly time passes, but 529 plans, I started investing on behalf of my my children back in 2000 can't believe I do have a 16 year old who just started driving so um, it time flies I remember buying your triplets bibs and here we are eight years later and uh, and so it's really this this today is an important discussion to hear about the options that folks have for savings um, you know congratulate everyone who's dialing in and, and certainly logging on to hear more about what the options are and how they can get started so I'm pleased to be here and help in any way that I can and uh, Looking yeah. forward to it. Definitely. And yeah, like Judy just said, just, just attending this is means you're ahead of the game and you're thinking about the right things because college costs are second only to buying a home as people's largest expense that they'll incur in their lifetime, which is pretty amazing. It is. Right? Um, a little bit about what we are and are not going to address in, in this particular event because we could probably talk about everything having to do with college savings until we're blue in the face, mm -hmm. right? Um, we're, we're going to... These are still some things that you want to think about. They're going to factor into your, your college savings experience you really want to think about budgeting we won't go into the fact that you probably should drink fewer lattes from starbucks today um, uh, investment selection what you're actually going to invest in once you select an investment vehicle um, certainly something that's very important you want to be thinking about but we won't cover that we will not be covering that uh, school selection financial aid information and, and student debt all of these things are going to factor into your ultimate goals and are things that you want to be aware of and kind of researching um, and we, we may cover them in another event but today i really want to talk about um, your savings options, which now that you've decided you need to save, how you should be saving, uh, how much college is going to cost, setting some realistic savings goals, the realities of financial aid, um, and then ultimately what, what you're going to use as your vehicle to get you there. 
So you said we could talk about this forever, but but in the spirit of the time that we have and making it easy for people to understand, what do they think about first? Right. So the first thing you really want to be thinking about is, all right, you know that college is going to be an expensive cost. You know that you're probably going to need to save. And just a little bit about how important that is. College costs are rising. I think everybody that's that's on the call knows that, right? But even call, even if you don't plan on spending, sending your child to a private four-year institution, which t- tends to be much more expensive than an in-state school or a four-year school, four-year state schools, about 80% of students attend a public four-year institution. Um, even though they're significantly less expensive, the prices, the, the costs have actually been rising at a greater rate than, uh, than private institutions over the past 25 years. So it's even, even if you're going to a less expensive school, it's still important to save because you don't know what that tuition rate is going to be by the time your your beneficiary attends school, um, and you don't want to wait. You know, don't be don't be a deer in the headlights and say, "Oh, it's so expensive. I'm just not going to bother. I'm going to hide all my assets and and rely on the government to pay for me." Yeah, we've even heard that college costs are rising um, at a faster rate, certainly than inflation, but even healthcare and some other you know major uh, daily expenses that folks know are going up, college is going up that much faster. Yeah. And there's, there's so many reasons for that, right? Administrative costs keep going up. The cost of keeping pace with technology increases. Um, just there's, there's tons of fact and the demand is there, right? As long as you have that many people meeting, making so much demanding that much education, they're going to see the costs continue to rise. Um, and it doesn't look like that's going to abate anytime soon. So, how do you how do you get there? How do you meet that shortfall? Right, um, like like I was saying, don't wait. the The worst thing you can do is wait. After this, after you're done in this event, you should close your browser, go over to savingforcollege.com, and start taking next steps to, to actually figure out what you're going to put your money into, um, because the the cost of waiting can be substantial. Um, even waiting one or two years, you're missing out on that much growth opportunity. Um, if you wait, for for example, if you wait nine years, if your child is nine years old and you haven't done any savings yet, it can cost you forty thousand dollars more to save for college, according to the current estimates in our in our college savings calculator. Um, we have a price of procrastination calculator you can visit on savingforcollege.com and see what the difference would be if you just waited two, three years to start investing. And, it's, and it can be pretty su- substantial. No, no, for sure. But it, I think if we were to look at the average age that people start realizing that they need to save, I, it might be. 10, it might be 11, it might be middle school that people really do start thinking about it. So I would say, ideally, you start as soon as the child is born and you have everybody contribute. But what if you are starting a little bit later? And, uh, there and are strategies, okay. yeah. That's always okay. If, even, if it, even if it's later, if your child's older, it's never too late to start saving. Every dollar that you put away now is a dollar that you don't have to borrow later, right? So even if your child is 10, 12, 16, you know, there are state tax incentives in a lot of states to... to um, help you get there as well. So even if your child's 16, 17 years old, 18 years old, or even in college, sometimes it's still worth it to put that money away to take advantage of certain tax benefits that may be available to you. So you, it's a good time to do your research and, and see what might be out there. Um, but it's a it's still a pretty intimidating goal. So the question is where do you start, mm-hmm. right? Um, and the first place to start is you really want to start by estimating your costs. How much is it going to cost you? So I mentioned earlier that it's going to cost me apparently $1.1 million to send all three of my kids to school, which is, if they were to go to the same school I went to, their estimated cost is about $1.1 million, which is very, very intimidating. But am I going to actually have to pay $1.1 million? No, I'm not going to have to pay one. That's the that's the sticker price at a four-year institution for all four of them to go. Ultimately, people pay for call That college cost is broken out over several different ways of funding it, right? You've got your own savings and so parent, parental savings and, and income counts for about 30% of what people are actually paying uh, the school. Beyond that, you're going to cover the, the difference with student income, student savings, um, scholarships, financial aid, and, and other and friends and family that are mm-hmm. helping out, assuming you have friends and family that can help out. God bless those friends and family, right? But also at this time of year, I think it might be important to say you can actually tell them when they say, okay, what can I get so-and-so for the holiday or what can I get for even a birthday, graduation, because everybody seems to be graduating from lots of things these days, whether it's dance school or kindergarten, you know, to let them know that you've got a plan set up and you'd really love at least for a little bit of a portion of of what they would normally give to that child and put it towards education. That's right. And depending on what you ultimately select as your your investment option, Five to nine plans. A lot of them will make gifting assets into the into the account a lot easier. They have special sure. tools that are out there. 
um, that will allow you to, to go online and, and make those contributions directly yourself. Um, yeah, so it's, it's definitely a good time of year to have that conversation with grandparents and relatives um, and forego some of those Legos in favor of uh, 50 bucks into the Just into the a couple account. of the Legos, yeah. I think everything in moderation. <laughs> I mean, we talk about savings. So save as often as you can, as you know, as early as you can, and as much as you can. It doesn't mean you need to save all at once. It's pref- you know, preferable certainly to do it, but do it in a way that's digestible for you and that makes sense. And don't expect when you see the sticker shock price that you need to save every penny of that, as you've said, Brian, but also say, okay, could I save a third of that cost? Could I pay a third with current income? Could I potentially take a third with a loan? So, you know, I, I'm sure you'll talk more about putting a plan in place, but I think it's really important for folks to know it can, you, you can just accept it and um, put a plan into place that's digestible for you. That's right. So if we take that 1.1 million, I get down to 320,000 if I'm only accounting for about a third of the cost, mm-hmm. right? So that's that's a more reasonable target. It's still a house, but you know now we're now we're starting to get down to a place where it's more reasonable. And if I don't go to a four-year private institution, if I do two years at a public institution and then transfer those credits into the private institution, yeah. you can cut it by another third, right? And so you just want to break it down as much as you can and try and make these realist these goals into realistic, attainable things, right? And is it worth it? You know, do people ask you as a college saving a lot of money? Is it worth it? It's, it's still worth it. It's definitely still worth it. Studies still show that. From a, from an employer standpoint, there are more jobs are more available for folks with a with a bachelor's degree. Um, they're earning more, and even even with the higher costs, um, it's it's still very much worth it to to attend higher edu- uh, a higher education institution, um, if only from a, a job perspective. Um, some of the realities. So you're going to meet that shortfall with all of these different pieces that make up the pie, right? Um, the realities of the financial aid, though, are most financial aid isn't in the form of scholarships and grants, and they're getting more and more difficult to get to because you have a lot more people competing for a limited pool of money. So you're going to find a lot of the financial aid that's being given now is coming in the form of um, student loans, right? And student loans are great, and they help people make pay for the cost of college, but rates are, you don't know what rates are going to be down the road, right? Right now, they're at an, almost an all-time low because rates in general are so low. So if you're paying 6% today, you could be paying 12% in 10, 18 years. You, you don't know what's going to happen in the future, right? So that makes just saving all the much more important, right? Absolutely. That's right. Um, so you know that college savings is important. Everybody everybody that's here is saying, all right, got to save for college. What do I do? Where do I put my money? So now you've got a, some money that you can set aside and you want to put it somewhere. Where do you put it, right? That's the big question because there's so many options out there. Well, there are seven main options, right? You have five to nine savings plans, Coverdell education savings accounts, and Roth IRAs are the ones that you hear spoken about most frequently. And I'll kind of go into a little more depth on those in a second. Um, but you've also got qualifying U.S. savings bonds. Um, My US, mom loved those. Everybody loves yeah. savings bonds, especially older folks that remember buying them when they were kids and getting them and that kind of thing. And they're especially fun to, to give to people now, right? Sure. It's this time of year people are talking about, oh, I'll give them a savings bond and you put it in the envelope. And, um, but the reality of U.S. savings bonds is that you're not going to earn substantial enough interest to cover that tuition. So if you put a dollar in today and you're earning, what I saw a Series E bonds this morning were at one-tenth of a percent is what they're earning. And then Series I bonds are earning a little over 2%, 2.5%, somewhere around there. But if college tuition is increasing at 6 to 8% a year, you're losing money immediately by putting, you're not even preserving your principal, you're losing money by Well, the reality is you used to be able to walk into a bank and get a savings bond, and now you need to either mail away for it or go online. It's a little more complicated, so maybe the grandparents go for cash. But nonetheless, all right, let's get to your list. You said you had seven. That's right. So, So, So seven, and only three of the seven are actually specifically designed for saving for college. Um, five to nine plans, covered LESAs, and UGMA accounts, which uh, UGMA, UTMA accounts are different in each state. Each state has its own laws and rules and regulations. Otherwise known as custodial accounts. Yep, custodi- custodial accounts. And it's a way for folks to gift assets to their children. The theory being that by giving them the assets, it's going to be then be in a lower tax bracket and they won't have to incur, you know, they won't be paying as much on taxes on the assets. Mm-hmm. These have become a lot less popular because. Um, you, you do have to pay taxes on the assets, and they get you get dinged significantly from the financial aid standpoint because those assets are now the student's assets. And when you're looking at the financial aid formula, the FAFSA, it looks at something called the expected family contribution. 
and the expected family contribution is made up of all these different little parts, and uh, the largest, most substantial portion is going to be student assets and income. So you don't want to put any more assets into the, stu into the student's pool than they're necessary. You want to keep it in the, in the parent pool or outside of the pool entirely if you can. Yeah, and I know this isn't going to be a discussion about financial aid today, but people might say, well, I don't want to save in something if I'm not going to get financial aid because of it. So talk about maybe of those options that you talked about, you know, what, what are the benefits of those options and how do they compare to one another? How do they get more information? Right. So from a, from a financial aid standpoint, uh, Roth IRAs, Coverdells, and 529 plans all have, and, and U.S. savings bonds to some degree, have uh, preferential treatment from a financial aid standpoint. Um, the savings bonds won't be considered until you actually redeem them. Same with uh, Roth IRA and traditional IRA. Unless you actually take the money out, it's not considered from a federal financial aid standpoint. Now, there's other forms of financial aid. Every school does their financial aid, um, comes up with their own financial aid formula and does it a little differently. Um, so financial aid is not a reason to not save in a 529, in a, in a savings plan. That's right, and yeah. it's a huge unknown because what a school is doing today for financial aid, what the federal financial aid structure looks like today, may not look anything like that in, in uh, 10 years or 18 years or however long you have until your student goes to, to college. Okay. And I don't want to go too much into current no. politics, but oh, you know, well. <laughs> who knows what the Department of Education and the lending system is going to look like down the road based on in, the incoming uh, President elect. Right. So, you know, the, you can't control what's going to happen next year. You can control what happens today, and that's saving as much as you can. That's right. Because every dollar that you have in hand is going to be a dollar that, uh, that you don't have to borrow down the road or worry about, <clears throat> or worry about getting down the road. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so, of the, of the other, other options, uh, I talked a little bit about qualified U.S. savings bonds, um, accounts. There's also just taxable investing, and in, in, investing in a regular brokerage or bank account, right? Just putting the money out there and it's, you're going to have to pay taxes when you take it out, but it's there and you have complete control and flexibility in what you do with that. And it's not so great from a financial aid standpoint because you're, you're exposed and you're going to have to pay taxes on it. So you're kind of hurting yourself right out of the gate because there are alternatives available where you can have tax benefit, you know, you have a tax benefit to saving. Um, but it's, it's out there and it does give you the most flexibility and control to, to use a taxable savings um, option. Okay. Yeah. Um, Roth IRAs, it's funny, whenever somebody brings up a Roth IRA with me, I, I kind of have to laugh inside because people are like, Roth IRAs are so much better. I mean, you can always put money in, you can withdraw the principal at any time, and it gives you, you know, it's, it, it is a tremendous savings vehicle. The Roth IRA is a retirement account. And the nice part is that you can withdraw principal at any time. So whatever you put in, you can take out and pay no penalties or taxes on. So from that standpoint, it's fantastic, right? And I think I think everybody that qualifies should use a Roth. It, it makes sense. But I don't like it when people say that a Roth IRA is a great college savings vehicle because you don't want to have to draw down in your retirement to save for college, right? You, what's the old adage? You can borrow for you can borrow for college, but you can't borrow for retirement. There right? you go. We hear it all the time. You can borrow for college, but not for retirement. Um, so every dollar that you put in the Roth IRA that you then draw down on for college you can't then use for your own retirement when when you hit that magic age and can withdraw it without without penalty. For sure. And the and the other thing I would say about a Roth in terms of just once you have a Roth and the type of investment option that you choose within it, there are other options that you can base on the age of the child, which helps out for college savings. And so with a 529 plan, which I know that you'll talk about, um, you can actually have an investment option that is actually tailored to your child's age and becomes more conservative as they approach college age. So I know some folks do like investing in the Roth and there certainly could be advantages there. I certainly um, get what you're saying about, you know, pull, anytime you pull money from your own retirement account, there's the, the time that you lose and the money that you lose from that, you can't get back. For That's sure. right. That's right. Um, the t and just so you know, I use all of these investments. I use a Roth IRA and a Coverdell and a 529 account. They all have their pros and cons and benefits. Um, the Roth IRA is, is tremendous because of that tax deferred growth because you're putting that money in after tax and it grows tax free for retirement. Um, but you are capped. You have to have earnings. And if you earn too much money, you actually can't use the Roth IRA at all anymore. You start earning earning out of the investment at 117 and then it fades out at 132,000 if you're um, if you're filing single. And if you're filing jointly, it's actually 
lower than that, it's 184 or something like that. Anyway, if you earn too much money, you can't use a Roth IRA, so it doesn't actually make sense for, for people that want to put away a significant portion of, of mm-hmm. money because you, you'll earn out. Right. Earning out, of course, is a, is a good problem, right? Because then you have too much you have too much money to put in there and you need to look for alternatives. Yeah, that's a good problem to have, right? Yeah. As long as you know what you're dealing with, as long as you know what you're, whatever you're choosing to save in, um, you need to know those parameters. So that's it's right. good to know that up front. So I tell people, if you qualify for a Roth IRA, you should probably be using it and putting in your maximum contribution every year. But I hesitate to tell people to use it like a 5 to 9 account or like a college savings account because those assets are earmarked for your own retirement. Um, and that's what you should be drawing down on it for, unless uh, unless absolutely necessary, right? If you're in dire straits, then it's there for you to draw on. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, you should be saving for your retirement in that account. Now, the Coverdell ESA, do you have anything more about the Roth IRA? Did I miss anything? No, I think we're good. I think we're good. So the Coverdell ESA, the Coverdell Education Savings Account, is another one of the vehicles that was designed specifically for saving for college. Um, It's a fantastic vehicle, um, but they're not available very widely. There's not a lot of people out there that provide them. You can actually go on savingforcollege.com and click on Coverdell ESAs, and there's a list there that will show you everybody that um, we track that does still provide uh, Coverdell accounts. They're really nice because... I would say Putnam does. Putnam so does. Th- we do, yeah. And, and, and they're fantastic vehicles because they offer you such a wide range of investment options. You have com- um, pretty much complete control over whatever you want to invest in. You s- maintain control of the account until the beneficiary reaches age of 18. Um, and they work a lot like a 5 to 9 in that they have, uh, they've received preferred treatment from a federal financial aid standpoint. Um, but there are some drawbacks too. Uh, the distribution, when the money actually comes out of the Coverdell, it always goes to the beneficiary. So if the beneficiary is not super trustworthy with the assets, maybe, or you, you know you can't trust them to actually put it into the into tuition, you know sometimes you just want to maintain that control with, over the account. That's a, that can be a pretty draw, big drawback for some so people. So there might be some differences on that depending upon the Coverdell that you choose. I know with custodial accounts, so we talked about an UGMA or an UTMA, mm-hmm. those at age of majority, um, that could be 18, it could be 21, mm-hmm. the money automatically goes to that child. They become owner of that account. With a Coverdell, at least with Putnam, the parent remains owner. Um, and the other benefit, I would say, of a Coverdell is that the money can be used not only for higher education, but K through 12 as well. So that's... Certainly a benefit in terms of flexibility of the funds. Yeah, that's the big advantage I think Coverdells have over 529s is that you can actually draw down on the assets before college for education expenses for K through 12. But then when the beneficiary hits age 30, they have to take the money. They have all the money, the account actually has to be closed and completely distributed out. So if there's any penalties or anything that by the time they're 30, you know, if they don't go to college, if it gets delayed, for whatever reason, if they reach age 30 and that account hasn't been drawn down on, it's it's wiped out at that point and you have sure. to take the assets out and pay any penalties associated with that. And there are there are limits in terms of how much you can put in per year with a Coverdell, um, as well as income limitations as well. So right. things the, to keep in mind. That's right. The one nice part about Coverdell is that you can also roll it into a 5 to 9. It doesn't go the other way. But if you have if you have a Coverdell account, you can always roll it into a 5 to 9 plan. So if... if and if you qualify, it has a similar restriction to Roth IRAs. I don't know if I mentioned it, where if you earn too much, if you earn over 110000 it starts to phase out and you can no longer use a Coverdell. And there's a $2,000 limit to what you can actually put into a Coverdell. So annually, it's $2,000, no more, mm-hmm. um, which isn't going to pay for much in terms of, of college down the line, right? That's, a, that's what, a book in 18 years? <laughs> it's a computer. Yeah. Um, so generally, a Coverdell is fantastic. It's flexible. It offers a lot of the same benefits as a five to nine, but it's probably not going to be sufficient for most people. You're going to want to use something else in addition. In order to, to it. save enough, right? To have for college. If yep. you qualify for it, if you're earning, if you're earning enough, or not enough to mm-hmm. earn out of it, um, it's a pretty tremendous vehicle. But okay, beyond so, that, so I was going to say, so we've talked about savings bonds, which are a little bit tougher to get these days, mm-hmm. um, and some of the the drawbacks there. We've talked about Roth. Certainly some benefits there, and we talked about a couple of the, the negatives. Um, and then we talked about a little bit on custodial accounts. I would say the one thing that we didn't say about custodial accounts is um, in terms of the, the funds being used, the funds can get used for any child uh, expense, right? So unlike Coverdell, which is going to be K through 12, um, and secondary or so higher education, UGMAS really can be used for anything on behalf of that child, which is helpful. Um, and then, and then we talked about Coverdell. 
Mm -hmm. right? And you've mentioned 529 throughout, but maybe you can talk a little bit about 529 plans and how they differ from those other options. Right, right. So 529 plans are, it's funny, our our founder, savingforcollege.com's founder, Joseph Hurley, um, writes a book and it's called The Best Way to Save for College. It's Mm -hmm. all about 529 plans. And we really do believe that it is the best way to save for college for, for most families. As I mentioned, I use everything for saving. I have a Roth IRA, a Coverdell, and 529 plans for my kids. Um, but everybody is going to have different things that make more sense for them. Um, so so what's a 529, right? right? Most people glaze over after they hear the name, right? doesn't have exactly the most catchy name, 529. Most people lost interest already, right? But 529s are, are excellent. They're state-sponsored or institution-sponsored uh, investment vehicles for saving for college. Um, the number one benefit is that it grows tax deferred and it withdrawals are tax free if used for higher education, qualifying higher education expenses. So no taxes while the money grows and no taxes when the money comes out as long as it's used for college costs. That's right. As long as it's used for a qualified expense. So what's that? So qualified expenses are going to be things like tuition, fees, room and board, supplies and equipment, you know, backpacks and right. books and that kind of thing, computers and internet expenses. So, you know, paying Fios or paying a, um, for the actual services for your for your computer that you just bought. Yeah. So it's you can use it for a lot Pretty of different broad. stuff. Mm-hmm. That's right. Some of the things that you can't use it for, you can't use it for travel costs. You can't buy plane tickets with it or or a new car. So there are some limitations to it, but for the most part, for for the average family, there's going to be plenty of costs associated with college to to use that five two nine for. So what if you save in a five twenty nine, and you need to take the money out for an emergency reason? So there are a number of uh, so. If you have to take a non-qualified expense, like if you just want the money or you just need the money for something else and it's not qualified, there's going to be a, you're going to have to pay taxes on the earnings plus a 10% penalty. And all withdrawals are prorated, which means that every withdrawal you take, unlike a Roth IRA where you can always withdraw the principal before you touch your earnings, you're always going to owe some tax on whatever withdrawal you make. And that's to you know encourage people to use this for its intended purpose, which is college savings. Um, the penalty is a 10% additional tax on But that's on only if you absolutely needed it and it wasn't going to pay for college That's right. Costs. And there are extenuating circumstances where you wouldn't have to pay that penalty. For yeah. example, if you went to um, a military, a certain military schools, if you go to West Point, if you get scholarships, you can withdraw the equivalent without paying the penalty. Wait, so stop there. So your kids are triplets and yep. they're brilliant or they're going to be like superstars in soccer. If they get a scholarship when it comes to college... Every penny that they get for a scholarship, let's say they got a five thousand dollars scholarship. So what happens? They can take money out of their five twenty nine at that same amount, mm-hmm. and they will not be taxed. They are all superstars when it comes to soccer. Of course, they are. Um, you can withdraw. So if you get a scholarship for five thousand dollars, a tax free scholarship, um, a tax free scholarship like a federal scholarship, sure. then you can withdraw that amount without paying the penalty, the ten percent penalty. But you'll still owe taxes on earnings. Okay. Um, so, so there's that, uh, what else, what else am I missing? Oh, state tax incentives, right? Over 30 states offer, I think it's 34 now, offer a, some sort of form of tax incentive. In fact, Massachusetts, yay, Massachusetts, we're, January we're broadcasting one. from, from the Boston area right now. Mm-hmm. We'll have our own tax incent- incentive coming next year. We'll be able to deduct a thousand dollars or 2000 if we're married filing jointly. Um, everyone should start with their home state. If you are thinking about using a five to nine plan, you want to start and look at your in-state plan first. Um, to see if there's a similar tax benefit for you. The tax benefits are very different across all the different states. Right. Um, different amounts, they treat them differently based on number of, um, some of them are per beneficiary, some of them are per account owner. Um, in some states, it can be a third party can contribute and they're responsible for reporting their own tax benefits. So you want to check out what your state offers and really understand the details around the tax incentive. There are tax credits out there. There are grants. There are so many great state programs, so definitely check out your individual state. But just know for any 529 plan at the federal level, the monies will always grow tax-free and come out tax-free as long as it's used for college costs. And then if you do have a state that will give additional tax incentives, um, so every maybe everything that you contribute can get de- um, sort of deducted from your annual report, if you will. Yeah. Um, that's that's great. Some states have matching programs. They also have scholarship 
program. So incentives, I think we've only seen those go up. We've, we haven't really hit, seen um, states that, that pull back on the benefits that they offer as far as college savings and, and 529s. Yeah, it's pretty rare to see a state remove any of its of, of its benefits. In fact, there are some states out there where you can only get the scholarship if you have a 529 account. They're kind of rewarding people for saving, mm-hmm. which is pretty fantastic. Um, can we talk about the control thing? Because you mentioned it earlier, and I think it's a really important point when people are thinking about how they're going to save for college. That's true. That's true because the covered L, as we mentioned, you have to the account is wiped out at the age of thirty, right? Right. Five to nine accounts aren't like that. Five to nines. If you're a control freak like me, and you want to always know what's going on in the account, and you want to have complete control over when it's distributed, uh, who it's distributed to, five to nine is the right option for you, right? Because you always have control as the account owner. Nobody and most states will not allow a joint account owner. So whoever is the main account owner is the account owner. Um, they have control over when distributions are made and to whom. Most distributions can be made to the account owner or the beneficiary or the st- or the school of record. And in some states, you can do it to third parties as well, like a landlord or, or whatnot. But you always maintain that control, and it doesn't end. So. If your beneficiary is 30 or 40, you still maintain control over that account and the assets. Here's what I like. So, you know, day one, your child is perfect in every way and you want to save on behalf of them. When they turn 18, if it was a custodial account, I, you know, you're turning that, that money automatically becomes theirs. If they decide they don't want to go to college, that money, they could just take it and go buy a motorcycle or decide that they feel like going to France. Um, with a 529, the control always stays with myself, the owner, the parent, the, or the grandparent, as the case may be. And, and that really does help you to have a plan in place for your child. And so when you know what's best for them, if that child does not go to college, it's great to know that, okay, I could switch the beneficiary to another child, um, or I could even change the beneficiary to myself, right? So let's say I wanted to go to an accredited cooking school in France, or someone wanted to go to a golf school, there are ways that you can even re-educate yourself. We hear so much about retirees going back to school to perhaps learn a different trade, that they want to do something different in retirement. Having control of those assets like you do with a 529, I feel like gives you the flexibility that you need, and, and they're your assets. So It totally does. And it's, uh, you know, I can't count the number of times that I've had a grandparent ask me if what happens to the account when they pass away and, and talks. And the question is, around control because the grandparent actually doesn't want their children to have access to the account. They only want the beneficiary to have access. They want to skip their own kids, right? Right. So depending on who you want to set up the account for, sometimes you can avoid uh, familial issues, you know, some of the social issues that uh, are kind of outside my scope. I don't want to touch on I just know I like options and a 529 with you in control, it gives you options. That's... Absolutely. So total control and the ability to revoke the gift if you if you absolutely need to. So that's the one thing that we don't always talk about is okay. if there's an emergency that comes up and um, you need the let's say that you encountered a medical issue, you know, and you need to draw down on you're you're searching for assets to draw down on and you need an emergency, you can actually revoke the account, pull those assets back to you. Now you're gonna you're gonna owe taxes and it returns back to your estate, but it's there if you need it as mm-hmm. as you know. Uh, A ripcord, you know? (laughs) Sure. We call that gifting with strings. Yeah, for sure. Gifting with strings. That's right. So certainly some tax benefits. You've got the the issue of control. Yeah. You've got the issue of control. Let's see. Uh, We talked about non-qualified withdrawals. Um, The nice one of the other parts is that anybody can contribute. Mm -hmm. So if I open an account for my kids, Judy can give money to my account, please. Please. (laughs) Um, Tis the season. It is the season. Uh, and, and like I said earlier, it, a lot of plans make it really, really easy for right. third parties to contribute as well. I know a census does their Ugift program, mm-hmm. but there are other gifting platforms out there as well where you can get a code and share it online, and right. it, it makes it super, super easy yeah, for other people to contribute. gift cards, and yeah, it's, it is. It's easy. The gift cards are nice, too. People really do appreciate those. Mm-hmm. Um, so 5 to 9 sound pretty great, right? Um, where would you go to get the, the question now is all right where do i go and get one right because there's no five to nine store out there i can't go into a bank and open a five to nine for the most case well, well in, you in a couple in a couple absolutely yeah, there's yeah. a couple's where you, there's a couple plans where they uh they may be sponsored by a broker that's affiliated with a bank and you go to them and, and sign up but most for the most part you're going to go to one of two places to open a five to nine account you're going to open it online directly yourself or you're going to go through a financial advisor and there's plenty of plans out there for folks no matter how you uh how you invest or, or want to put the money away um, you can go to savingforcollege.com 
right now and look up any plan, look up your state plan, and it will give you some guidance as to how to, in, how to enroll in the plan itself. There's an enroll now button with most of the, most of the plans that are out there. Um, you can enroll directly yourself through the plan's website for most of the direct sold plans, the ones that are selling directly to investors. Um, or you can talk to your financial advisor about what options are available to you through the advisor. Financial advisors often have access to different um, different 529 plans that are actually available to the investment public. So you may be able to get access to different um, investments, uh, more customized options. You know, The plans are structured differently so that they uh, allow different utility and access to different investment selections. Right, so every 529 plan has the features and benefits we just talked about, yeah. but they will differ in terms of the actual investment options that you can have. So some plans um, will have sort of a multi-managed approach. You'll be able to choose an investment option that's managed by perhaps a couple of different managers. They mm -hmm. certainly have age-based options. Again, that investment is based on the age of the child and automatically becomes more conservative as that child approaches college age. So, um, so yeah, so different investment options, certainly fees are consideration. And then again, always making sure that you know the benefits of your own state plan is helpful. That's right. I like to talk about 529 plans like museums. And every museum is curated. You know, this, the state ultimately is sponsors the, the product, except for the case of the independent 529, which I'll come back to. Um, but the state sponsors the vehicle, and they will either manage it themselves or they'll have a third party administ uh, administer the program. And then the underlying investment options are provided by the state, and they may be uh, mutual funds or other accounts, but generally they're broken up into portfolios. And you can invest in any number of the portfolios that are curated by the state. These are the ones that they make available to sure. you. Sure. And I think it's important to note that there are many different 529 plans. Each may be sponsored by a state. But that doesn't mean if you choose a state plan, you have to go to school in that state. As a matter of fact, you could be you know, a Florida resident, choose um, Putnam 529 from America that's sponsored by Nevada, but then ultimately your beneficiary could go to school in California. These, these are very flexible plans. Again, there might be sponsorship by a particular state, but the assets um, and really distributions can be used nationwide at any school that's accredited. That's right. That's right. And some you can also check with your employer. There are not a lot yet, but more employers are kind of signing on and doing more employer-sponsored plans where you can actually purchase it through your employer. So, check so that would be employer. sort of not similar to a 401k, but in the way that you can save workplace savings for retirement, there are some employers that will um, provide the opportunity to save in a 529 plan through That's payroll right. deduction or perhaps through your checking or savings account. It's always good to check with your employer. That's right. And even if your employer doesn't offer a 529 plan, often you'll be able to do payroll deduction through them. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and one of the things I wanted to touch on was we pretty much talked about 529 savings accounts this whole time. I haven't touched on prepaid plans. Yeah. So there are, there are two types of 529 plans. The ones we've been talking about are savings plans where you can invest in underlying portfolios and select your own investments. Uh, they work a little bit kind of like a 401k. You, you have control over what it's being invested in and how it works. A 529 prepaid plan works more like a pension plan where you put, the, you put money in and it grows at a set rate and is guaranteed to be a certain amount at a certain time. Right? Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Well, for the most part, guaranteed. All right? Every state works a little differently in how they guarantee the assets. Um, and the independent 529 plan, which is its own unique animal. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it can be very nice as far as I'm putting in my dollar today, and it's going to be worth $1 in tuition in the future no matter what. Right? And they offer also most plans offer a lot of flexibility as far as they will allow you to do payouts. To Some of them have restrictions as far as you need to use them in state, and then they'll have guidelines around if you want to go to out of state. It's not like you're not going to have access to your money, but you want to make sure that you understand whatever the guidelines and, and restrictions are on the prepaid plan before you invest. It's a tremendous investment option right. to be able to guarantee tuition in today's dollars, especially when tuition's rising at 6 to 8%. That's a, that's a pretty good return, right? Mm -hmm. But you can't use it necessarily for as many of the expenses as you can use a savings plan for. Sometimes it's limited to tuition and fees. Um, so you want to kind of check the fine print on that. Um, the independent 529 plan is actually a pretty cool investment option too because it's not state-sponsored. It's it's a group of schools that have come together to guarantee tuition, future dollars of tuition in today's dollars. So you put in a dollar today and it's guaranteed to be a dollar in the future within their participating schools. And how many schools would you say are in there? Oh, you had to ask me off the top of my head. But, but there's hundreds of schools that participate. Hundreds, okay. Um, so that's another option that's out there. So we talked about 510 savings and prepaids. Um, have I missed anything? I think we've talked about all the different investment options that are available. Okay. Um, 
I think the most important thing to do is to not get overwhelmed. Like this is getting to some pretty nitty gritty stuff, right? And we're, st- I would say we're we're still looking at high level stuff, right? But, sure, we're but, looking at the basics. But for the average investor, this can get pretty overwhelming. So don't get overwhelmed. The point is to go out there and and start investing. Even if you don't pick the perfect plan, starting sooner is better. You can always roll into another five to nine account. You can roll a Coverdell into a five to nine. You can always move the money around if you have to, if you find that you've made a mistake. Mm-hmm. But you can't go back and take advantage of growth if you don't get the money into an account first. Um, so, you know, you've heard about the seven different vehicles. You can go online to savingforcollege.com and look and look and compare all these different vehicles to one another online. More, all the details are available out there very easily. There's a compare, compare your savings options tool available. That's right. And, at, and actually at, at um, putnam.com as well, we, ha- we do have a comparison tool. And you can choose what's most important to you. We talked about a few sort of high-level benefits. If you're concerned about taxes, if, you're, uh, if control is a big issue for you, maybe it's the investment selection. So it's a, it's a simple tool that will help you sort of narrow down your choices because I love options, but I also like when you can quickly eliminate some of the ones that aren't right for you. And I think that we've talked about a lot of options. I think once you take a look at Saving for College or um, or Putnam um, or other you know calculators, etc., you can quickly narrow down what's right for you based on your own solution, based on your own situation. Yeah, it's definitely true. I think the most important thing you can do is to make sure that you're matched up with the right vehicle. Um, get out there, put some, put it in the right vehicle for you, and start saving today. Start saving. Um, okay, anything anything else that we should mention before we go? No, that was fast. I don't see any questions coming up in, uh, any questions? I see some thumbs up, but no questions. So, uh, before we go, I did want to announce the contest winner, um, Dana Mangon, or Mangone, I hope I'm pronouncing the name right. Oh, where are you looking? Right over here, I see Dan- Donna Mangone, Man- Mangon, Mangon, I like I'm Mangon. go with it. <laughs> Just so you know, um. Oh, I do have somebody telling me that there are some questions. Did I miss them? Let me take a look here and see if I I don't see any questions appearing. They go to notifications. I can't miss the questions. All right, so we have a question from Jonathan Matthews. Oh, I guess a pop-up's coming up. I put a small amount in a in a UTMA for my daughter years ago. She's now a high school junior. Is it worth transferring to a five two nine? Um, so that's a good question. It may be. It may or may not be worth transferring into a five two nine. It depends on uh, this, your state. If there's an in-state tax benefit, it, it almost cer- certainly is. You want to check. Go online to savingforcollege.com. Pull up your state. See if there are any state tax benefits offered associated with that. Beyond that, since she's already at college age, probably doesn't. It, it probably won't make sense outside of any tax incentives. And the thing to note about a, a UTMA or um, an UGMA account is that once you set up a custodial account, it will always be a custodial account. So if you wanted to switch it to a 529 thinking, okay, then I get control of the assets, that's not the case. So it will still maintain that custodial um sort of account where the mandate is that child will become owner of the assets at right. age of majority. So really the reason that you'd move it into a 529 is so that those monies could grow tax-free and come out tax-free. You certainly do still have some time, but um, but you know certainly you don't have as much time as some, if someone were a little bit younger. Yeah, it's, it's unlikely if she's already in college that you're going to see significant benefits from putting it inside the 529 at this point, if you're drawing down on the full value of the account. Now, if you want the account to continue to grow tax deferred indefinitely, then it might make sense to roll it into the Yagma Upma. And, right. But, so it's, those, but it's always going to be a custodial account. It'll if be, there was so much in there that there would be additional money that you'd maybe give to a second child or have uh, other uses, perhaps. But if we're just talking about that one child. Right. That's right. Yeah. Um, let's see. What else what do we else? have on here? Can both parents do it for a single child? So the, most states only allow one account owner, but each parent can open an account for the same child that's not a problem yeah i have one and my husband has one yeah so you can do that if you're under so there are maximum account limits for um a plan so Mm -hmm. you need to be cognizant of that so three hundred and seventy-one thousand. so there's certainly 
they're you know high enough maximum account limits but you might want to make sure that you are saving number one with the maximum account limit in mind and then if you're both contributing you want to make sure that you don't go over your annual gifting limits which um, for 529 it's or for really any gifting limit it's 14,000 for a single person and then double that so um, 28,000 for a married couple in any given year yeah I think that that covers it all right so let's see Next question, I have one 529 plan for two kids. I want to use half for each child. Will that hurt my scholarship chances? Um, so from a federal aid standpoint, it won't. Ha it will receive uh, what we call preferred status, but from a scholarship standpoint, it shouldn't have any, the scholarships are generally considered outside of Well, I think of it would depend on the scholarship. That's right. If they're talking from a financial aid perspective, it really sits in two buckets. It's either going to be an asset or it's going to be income. So it's either an asset of the parent or the child, and in that case, it doesn't matter if you have one 529 account or six 529 accounts, it all counts as assets of the parent, which by the way, count much less in the calculation for financial aid. So we're talking they expect 5.6% of those assets um, to be used for college versus if it were sitting as income, if it's income, then it counts you know, about 50% in the calculation. Right. So it really doesn't matter, I don't think, whether you have one or have more than one account. That's right. The only real reason to have more than one account is from an administrative perspective. So if you have one account and you have two kids, if they're closer than four years of age, it can become kind of a pain because you have to change beneficiaries before you can take withdrawals to one beneficiary versus the other. Mm -hmm. So there are some logistical issues around having multiple accounts, but from a pure financial standpoint. If you're just thinking about it from like a scholarship perspective. Right. It, then it doesn't matter if you have multiple accounts or not. Okay. Um, how many times? How many times can you change your investment mix in a five to nine account during a calendar year? So it's now two twice per year you can change your allocation within a five to nine account. It used to be that you could only do it once. A few years ago they changed the law, so now you can make up to two reallocations per year. Mm -hmm. uh, but you could also dollar cost average if you wanted to. So if you really wanted to make sure that you're dripping in a little bit at a time, mm -hmm. many programs like Putnam has a dollar cost averaging program. So you could put money, maybe a larger lump sum into a money market and then choose another option that you wanted to slowly give into. So it, that could be on a monthly basis, a quarterly basis, semi-annually, et cetera. And that helps you get into the, the cycle a little bit as well. Um, I did notice that someone asked, um, should I open a 529 for each child? I'd say one thing to think about there is tailoring it to that child's age, right? So when you think about investing, it's really important to understand how much time you have to save. And part of that is understanding how old the kids are. So if you have kids that are very close in age, um, really, the, I think I said this earlier, an age-based option works because it becomes more conservative or becomes it gets closer more into cash as the child approaches college age. If you only have one 529, it's meant for both kids. Obviously, the, um, the age-based option may not be the best option for both children. That's right. Um, there are also tax incent incentives depending on how your state treats the taxes. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have a state where... Um, the tax incentive is per beneficiary, you, it might make more sense to open multiple accounts because then you can, if it, let's say it was a $2,000 tax deduction per beneficiary, you want to have three accounts so you can get $6,000 worth of tax deductions, right? But if you're in a state where it's per account owner, then one account is, is probably going to be fine. So again, it's knowing what the, what the benefits are to you and then structuring it. That's right. So you really want to understand what's available to you in your state. And if the in-state tax benefit is worth it, then yeah, you may want to restructure how you're, how you're saving. And if this is any of this is getting overwhelming or confusing, please hit me up in the forums. We have forums at forum.savingforcollege.com, and I'm happy to follow up and answer any questions that you might have there as well. Yeah, and and because um, Putnam is distributed through financial advisors, we really do promote the certainly the online tools, but the advice a financial advisor can offer, we feel like is really beneficial here too. That's right, and you can always call the plan too. So Putnam, like many Absolutely. providers, you can always call into the plan. The people that are taking those calls every day live and breathe five two nines. I know all this all too well from sitting at a census where we were answering calls right down in Newton, Massachusetts. That's you right. hear all the questions coming in all the time, and they're they're there to help folks. Um, what else? We, what else do we have here? Uh, da, 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 da. What are the contributions limit, limits to a five to nine plan? So, contribution limits vary from state to state, but generally it's going to be somewhere north of three hundred thousand to four hundred thousand dollars. That's that's where you see the the most of the plans capping out their uh, investment limits. Right, and so every state will calculate 
why, like why is there a different um, amount per state, but typically they do have an actuary that tries to determine how much you'll need to save to average the uh, average cost of college for, in some cases, you know, say five years of college, because in many cases, kids don't, don't finish school in four years. So they typically do make sure that the amount that they're offering up is enough to save. And then right. the individual years you can save, I think I mentioned, you can gift up to 14000 if you're single, married 28000 per year per beneficiary. Right. But when you're also when you're thinking about limits, you want to be conscious of gift tax rules, right? Because you can only gift ta- uh, 14000 per year without incurring gift tax penalties mm-hmm. per beneficiary. Now, five five to nines have a special uh, are treated have a little special treatment where you can forward fund that five years. But then you're starting to come down into a very technical and a little more detailed role than I kind of wanted to get into today. Yeah. But you can super fund a five to nine account to get up to what is it fourteen hundred and forty thousand a year. That's right. Yeah, one hundred and forty thousand. So if in you're one married, year. you can in the first of a five year period, you can actually um, instead of the fourteen thousand, you can do five years all at once. So that's seventy thousand if you're single, one hundred and forty married, and um, and then you don't give them anything for the next four years. Right. So when you're yeah. thinking about contribution limits, just make sure you're also thinking about oh, I have gift tax limits as well. You can you know you can certainly put four hundred thousand dollars into an account or yeah, whatever I, the limit is. Sure. But there may be uh, gift tax penalties associated with that. Mm-hmm. Um, what else do we have? We have a relatively small amount in our five to nine plan, less than twenty thousand. Uh, first year of college is more than that amount. Should we spend it down to cover the first year, or would it be better to dole it out over the first two years? So, so what is so what are they asking? So they don't have enough to that they're going to be drawing on it for all four years, right? Okay. They oh, so they're the saying, do amount. I pay it up should front? Should I just spend it all now, or should I wait? Yeah. Um, typically, spend it all now. Lock in your tax benefit. You have no idea what next year is going to bring, right? So, if you have expenses that qualify today, and you're a parent or student. Generally, it makes sense to take them earlier rather than later. It's different for for a grandparent owned account. I'll come back to that in a second. But because you don't know what the future brings, you don't know. If, uh, you know, maybe they end up stopping college after a year or two years. Maybe they transfer. Maybe they pursue another life event. You don't know what the future holds. So the point is, if you have a qualified expense during this year, it's typically more conservative to lock in that tax benefit now rather than wait and put, uh, right. Well, I think everybody's situation is different. I certainly do agree that you don't know what the future brings. I will say it's really important that if you are going to take a distribution from your 529 plan, make sure that there is an expense associated with that year. So let's say someone did decide to wait and didn't spend it until like the the senior year. So let's say my daughter graduated from college last year and I said, oh, you know what? I have money left in that 529. I think I'll take it. You have to do it in the same calendar year that the expense occurred that's so important. I've read sad blogs on your site actually saying, "I'm my kid's done with college, now can I take out the money? And you can, but there's going to be taxes associated. So make sure that when you do take it, it's in the same year that you actually incurred the expense. Right. So if you get a bill in December for tuition... Mm-hmm and you pay that bill in December, you want to take the corresponding withdrawal in December. Right. You, you don't want to put it off because if you pay that, pay that, if you paid that bill in December and then take, want to take a withdrawal the next year, it's, you're going to get penalized for it. Um, what kind of documentation do you need to present for qualified withdrawals? So it, it's like any other audit from the IRS. They're going to ask that you provide uh, receipts and, and information if you, if you do happen to get aud- audited. Well, you want to keep your receipts. It's yeah. not a given that you're that you're audited, but it's not something that in order to take a distribution. So Putnam's not going to ask you for receipts. That's right. Five times are self-reporting. So what you're going to do is you're going to say, this is the amount that I had in qualified higher education expenses this year. And you submit that off to the government. It goes off and gets processed and everybody's happy. Mm-hmm. In the event of an audit, you may have to justify those expenses though. And that's Is when that what would... the question is or is it... What kind of documentation do you need to present for qualified right. so in withdrawals? Terms of so ultimately, actually no, taking you don't have out, to give anything. That's right. So, so as a plan provider, I would say when you need the money, you tell us how you need the money. You can call. Um, you could certainly and submit. You know, there are forms on the site that you can take a look at. But you give us a call, 
and we'll help you get those monies, whether you need it to, to yourself um, or whether that goes straight to the schools. Tons of flexibility there. That's right. So when you do take that withdrawal from your 529 account, what's going to happen is it's going to generate a 1099Q that comes from the 529 plan, and that tells you that you made a withdrawal during that year and, and for how much. That's right. We give the supporting paperwork so you have that for tax time. That's right. Yep. But if you if you do need to justify the, justify the withdrawals to the IRS in the event of an audit, that's when you would have to actually have your receipts and all that good stuff. That's right. That's right. Um, You're assuming the worst. I all, you know, <laughs> I plan for the worst. That's okay, what I do. Okay. I have three kids. I got to do that. You know, what's the worst that can happen? Oh, you can have three kids at once. Oh, yeah. That is not. That is a blessing. <laughs> I don't want any more blessings then. <laughs> I don't want the blessings. Um, all right. So where do you find your state tax benefits? Somewhere in Saving for College? Yes. So if you go to savingforcollege.com, and you select your your state, it's right there on the top left. You know, what is a 529 plan? There's a map right on the landing page. Click on the click on the map of the country, select your state, and you can scroll down for any individual plan. So easy. It is super, super easy to find your tax benefit. Um, also, every state plan, you'll find that information on their website and their program disclosure documentation. They hit you with it lots of times. So the information is definitely out there and easy to get. I think for that sure. we, pr- we make it easy on savingforcollege.com, of yep. course. Absolutely. Um, and I would just say of all the topics that we talked about, uh, Putnam does have a website called the Wealth Management Center, and that gives lots of information, not only on things of how to save for college, but the best ways to distribute for college, um, sort of a checklist of things that you should be thinking about. So if you do have those additional questions, and we've certainly heard a lot of those today, so you can go to Putnam.com and the Wealth Management Center certainly has lots of topics on, on college savings and beyond. So, That's right. If I may. That's right. And uh, another great question that I get all the time. If you take out too much money, can you put it back within the calendar year? And this is one that you have to be really careful about. So if you take a, if you take a withdrawal and, oh, I took too much money, you can't just put it back in. That's going to look like a non-qualified, uh, it's going to look like a non, it's going to be a non-qualified withdrawal and it'll get put back in and it'll look like a new contribution has been made. Um, and it actually gets a little complicated. So if you, if you take it out, you have 60 days to roll it into a new plan. Now, if you took that money out and it was too much because you were reimbursed uh, tuition from the school, then you can put it back in without penalty within 60 days. But otherwise, it's going to look like a non-qualified withdrawal, and you need to either roll it into a new 529 account in a separate state, and then you can get around you can get around any penalties associated with that. Um, but you don't want to just put it back into the account without uh, looking at the rules and seeing if there's any exceptions you qualify for. And it would be that limited time. It wouldn't be a year or more. That's right. It's 60 days. So if you're outside that 60-day window, then it's going to be a, you may be incurring tax penalties. It'll be a non-qualified withdrawal yeah, if, again, if you don't have associated paying school. attention to and making sure that you um, understand how the money is going to get used. But, but there's some flexibility yeah. there. If you take out too much, the best thing to do is to step back and see, all right, did I miss any expenses and see if you can get something to, to back it up. Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't, then you can check and see if there are any scholarships and maybe avoid the tax penalty on it. Um, if you can have a qual- uh, scholarship that, for the amount that you took the over withdrawal for, then you can just claim that as a scholarship exception yeah. and, and avoid that. Yeah, but 10%. those are all good questions, and I think when you're looking into the plan that's right for you, you'll see some of those benefits. And again, Saving for College is a great uh, resource for that. All right, yeah, and we're coming up at the end of our our hour time limit. I didn't that's think we'd cool. go all the way to the end here, but we got about three minutes left. I'll see if I can hit one or two more questions. Is it better to contribute a little bit per month or a big chunk in a year? So that's an interesting question because um, there's two sides to that. One, should I dollar cost average or put all the money in one lump sum? That's mm-hmm. the question, right? And that's really a question of market timing. So in theory, if you put it all in earlier, you have more time for that money to compound and, and accumulate interest. I guess it depends on your personal financial situation, your risk tolerance, and what that money is doing right now. If the money is not doing anything, maybe it makes sense to put it all in now so that you can take advantage of potential growth. Um, Otherwise, if you can also drip it in from your account. You can do automatic contributions. Um, two dollar dimensions, cost average. Yeah, dollar cost right. average in uh, from another account. Pull it on an automatic basis, on a monthly basis, uh, so that you're not hit if the market takes a takes a tumble during a particular month. You're, all of your money is not in at one time because five to nine accounts are not guaranteed investments. Um, Unless it's a prepaid tuition plan, of course. Yeah, I think, I mean, when you think about investing, and I said it earlier, I've probably said it more than once, you save as often as you can, as early as you can, um, you know, and as much as you can. And so if that, if you have an opportunity where you have some money that can be earmarked for college savings, 
I say go for it. But I will say dollar cost averaging is best because nobody knows where the market's going to go. So I would say if there is a plan that can, you can put money in, so now, okay, that's put away for college savings, and then dollar cost average it in if it's a large enough amount, um, that's kind of the best of both worlds. Yeah, there's definitely benefits to, to both sides. Dollar cost averaging would be a more conservative investment approach, I would, I would say, mm-hmm. right? Um, one more, que- I think one more question, then we're going to have to go. How to choose the right plan? I love this question. I think that's probably one of the most common ones other than what's a qualified expense, right? Yeah, I think it's, it's based on what's important to you. And I, and I do think, we talked about a lot of options, you will quickly find that one is going to work for you maybe better than others. And that depends on how much time you have, how you want to use the monies. Um, mm-hmm. And maybe, maybe it is a combination of plans. You have several. So I think that there, again, are many tools to help, help you kind of whittle it down, uh, whether it's on Saving for College, whether it's at Putnam. There are certainly calculators out there. There are certainly financial advisors out there. But there are also, you know, sort of, online tools that can help you whittle it down for you. No no one best plan out there for any one person. I thought the Putnam plan was the best plan. Well, out we're there. fantastic. I mean, <laughs> so if we're going to say, you know, if we if you, you do performance rankings and when you take a look at the 5-year numbers, we're the number one advisor sold plan for 5 years, um, we're the number two uh, advisor sold plan in terms of a performance ranking for a three year period. So we, we've, you know, we've, we've been fortunate enough to, um, to have experience going back to 2000 and we're, you know, kind of committed to making sure we've got innovative solutions going forward. So, um, and yeah, I know, I know we're running out of overtime, but as far as picking the best plan or the, the, what the right plan is for you, start with your in-state plan, look at what tax benefits are available to you and, and how the plan ranks what its expenses are and if the investment options that are in it are the right ones for you that's a good place to start sure. um, and if uh, if the, you can find actually uh, what is your state tax uh, benefit worth there's an actual calculator to put a dollar amount on how much your tax benefit is worth on savingforcollege.com under our tools and calculators section um, so certainly go on there and figure out if that tax incentive actually makes sense versus an out-of-state plan where you might actually earn more because of lower costs right. it's gonna it's gonna be different for everybody I wish I could say there's a magic bullet and, oh, you just want to use the Putnam plan. I think the magic bullet is saving. So congratulations on getting to that step. (laughs) So we're going to sign off now, but I do encourage you, please go out there and take a look on savingforcollege.com, open an account, start putting that money away today. You can't start soon enough. All right. Anything else before, to say before no, we go? Happy holidays. Just want to thank you so much again, Judy, for joining us. Oh, my us. pleasure. Thanks for it having really, me. It was really great to have you on in our first, uh, our first Facebook Live event. Very exciting. All right, everyone. Thank you very much, and, and have a good day.